Oh, this is mad stuff. COVID-19 won't let me go out and do my country walks, but I have something else for you and you're going to find it interesting. It's a little story. Well, you've probably heard the saying that fact can be stranger than fiction. And this story tonight is absolutely bang on the money. So as I snuggle down here this evening, listening to the summer thunder showers crackling outside, I'm just nice and cozy. I'm about to get into my little story. Now there's no one out there listening to this who doesn't know this book. But do you actually know a man called Alexander Selkirk? I say not many of you do. And this book is about him. And it's probably one of the most famous books in the world. So you scholars out there might have guessed this already, but it's actually the book about Robson Crusoe. Now, we're not going to be actually delving into the book on Robson Crusoe. Uh, even so, we all know it. He was on an island for 34 years. He had Man Friday. The only friend he had was uh, a dog he bought off the ship. And he had a couple of goats and a couple of things. We probably would not have heard of him at all if it wasn't for a fantastic author. A man called Daniel Defoe. And Daniel Defoe was born in 1660 and he was from London. Alexander was born where? Okay, with the name Selkirk, it could only be one place and now Scotland. So he was born in a little town or a little fishing village called Largo and that was in County Fife. Now, he, he was, um, he was a, a bit of a hot-tempered laddie. So when he was younger, he, did, he, did, he didn't fit into school 100%. He did get in trouble and he did start a few fights in his day. So he was getting a bit bored when he got to his uh, 16, 17, 18 years of age. Uh, and he wanted to head out of his little fishing village. So he had a, a confrontation with his father. His father didn't want him to go. So uh, eventually, after a second year... He got his own way and started, decided to head off to London. So Alexander said goodbye to his mum and dad, Youth Freaks and John Selkirk. And he would have been going up to London with one thing in his mind. He wanted to go off on the ships, the big four riggers. And in those days, uh, going off to sea uh, and to see the world, it would have been, uh, you know, it would have been sort of, Oh, adventure would have been everything it would have been for the money because as some of you know from some of the old Hollywood films it was a tough life and it certainly was a tough life so when he got to London he headed off to sea and he went off to sea for his first six years we don't really know too much about the the name of the ship he was on so but we do know that he did get uh, from just a deckhand up to an officer and an officer and a navigator. So I suppose the two of them went in hand because you couldn't be a navigator all day long. Uh, so he came back in 1701 and he decided to head back home again to Largo. No sooner than he got home, he got himself in trouble. Uh, it's worth mentioning that his mother loved him because he was actually the seventh son of a seventh son. So she thought he was a bit special. Uh, maybe he was. So what happened when he got home, he got into a fight with his two brothers or his two brothers held a prank on him and he ended up drinking a drink of salt water and he didn't take it kindly and what he did was he got a staff and he started baiting the head off them especially one of them especially uh, a staff a big stick with a big no staff so <laughs> and the reason we know this is from the crooks session right uh, 1658 to 1919, which gave the powers of the local elders uh, to give a little bit of punishment out or make decisions on what's to be done to local people in the local parish. Obviously, it's just a, the beginning of all the courts and things like that. So the records are up. That's where all the facts are for that, because it's all down. It's all down the records. So it's easy, you know, I can, I can look all this stuff up. 
So he said to his family, I've had enough of all you small minded people. I'm heading back to London. I want to go back to sea. Or I don't know if he said those exact words, but I'm just the modern way of saying it. So he headed back to London anyway. By the way, before I go any further, just to let you know that I actually have the original Robson Crusoe's dog with me here. And he's the meanest dog ever. Say hello. Say hello. All right. Back to bed. It was around this time when uh, Alexander got back to London. The things in, in England changed slightly. Uh, as in Queen Anne of England was having right old trouble with the Spanish and the French. And they were just going for it, like just fighting and robbing from each other and uh, all that sort of stuff. So Queen Anne uh, decided to uh, make this new decision. And it was she was going to give uh, any guys with nice big sailing ships a letter and these letters were called the letter of mark and basically what that meant is she was giving them rights to do privateering privateering legal pirates and any golden bullion and monies to be brought home to the exchequer uh, the the privateers would get uh, four fifths four fifths and the queen would get uh, one fifth I have to work that I I just do metric right and in comes Captain William Dempsey now Dempsey was the bio this fella right this fella had gone around the world a fairly big thing in those days and he was known he was publicly known people knew him and loved him but as we were to see in later on he wasn't all that nice when he was out on the job because he treated some of the lads really bad he would uh look you know you remember the old the old the old pirate films and all where they all get lashed and they were whipped up in the all that with chains and all it was all true and did you ever hear of um keel hauling keel hauling was true and just keel hauling you're hauled around the keel. So what they used to do is they used to tie a rope around one of the masks, hang the the the, the uh, one of one of the lads, which wasn't maybe he wanted to be uh, starting trouble or stealing food, and it, it'd be tied around his feet, and they put a rope on the, on the other side and they pull him, and of course under all those boats to be a load of old barnacles and all that onto the wood. And he'd drag him around and pull him up the other side and it'd be all ripped. Uh, it would not would not give you a good day. And funny enough, funny enough, there's not many lads actually died from that. Even so, I can imagine he gets some, oh, some atrocious infections. But anyway, I digress. So uh, William Dempsey organised two ships. One was called the St. Andreas. And the other one was called the Sink Ports. No, Sink Ports. And they were heading down to Buenos Aires because that's where they'd find all the Spanish galleons and the booty. As privateers, they were going to relieve them of all their spawn doodles. Captain William Dempsey and the two ships headed off anyway. And this is where Dempsey showed his true colours. Uh, away from home where no one could see him he had a bit of trouble with one person on his ship and he pulled up to a portuguese penal colony which obviously they had them and he threw your man off and left him there and headed off don't know what happened to him but he also at a later stage threw a group of lads off at a at another port and left them there he just didn't get on them. So we have a little change of crew here now. Um, Pickering ends up dying. And uh, we get a new captain on the sink ports. And his name was Sterling. So this is where Alexander Selkirk's uh, story really takes off. And this is where the Robinson Crusoe story really starts as well. Alexander's hothead 
would sort of kick in again. And he had this, you just awful time with straddling, not sturdling as I said earlier, straddling, straddling, uh, that he was eventually going to ask to be left off at the next nearest island. And straddling, uh, which didn't like him at all, said, I can facilitate that. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so we eventually get to an island called Juan Fernandez. And that was actually 400 miles off the coast of Chile, which is 650 kilometers. And this is where he was going to get uh, dumped off. Uh, and he asked for it. Okay. So, and this is actually in his own words. So he got um, the longboat and he was sent to shore. Uh, and he was given a chest and a musket and uh, a Bible and a box of chocolates and they put him off and in his own words when he got when he got off onto the isle uh, off onto the beach on the island uh as the long boat was pulling off he realized i think i made a mistake he started, he ran down the beach shouting uh, i wanted to come back i wanted to come back but all they did was this adios amigo you know spanish juan fernandez okay anyway so the first thing he found himself doing was setting up camp in uh, the caves on the beach and he decided to move off the beach because uh, one night he heard this uh, screaming and it was pitch black and he wasn't getting up to go out and see what it was so the next morning he went out and he found this tribe of sea lions that moved in I mean a lot of them the whole beach for them so he moved uh, up the beach a bit and he made himself two little huts and these huts were made from pampas grass and uh, one was uh one he was sleeping in and the other one he had for cooking in and on the island there was a uh, goat and these goats would have got to the island from previous ships because this island had water and uh, it was a bit of a if anyone's running low on provisions uh, ships in it end up there so uh today's standards his diet wasn't bad because he had his goat he had um uh, well, I don't think he killed the sea lions, but he could have if he wanted to, I suppose, if he could catch them. They're a bit dangerous, those. But he had fish and he had shellfish. So he did all right. The only other thing was maybe he was lacking company. No, he wasn't actually. He The, the island was full of uh, cats, which were also brought in. And obviously feral cats, but they came friendly with them. And he used to um, have them as buddies and played around with them and had them living with them and all that. So uh, he was doing all right there. And as time went on, he was actually quite happy in his own company. And as I said, he got more religious uh, reading his Bible every day. So he said, another thing he said he did every day, which I find a little bit hard to believe now, but these are in his own words. He said that uh, he used to go up the top of a, of a mountain or a, a hill and he used to uh, light a fire every night and he'd have that fire and he said it would be going all night and sometimes during the day and he said he did that every night uh, for uh, obviously for looking for ships and put the smoke up and all that sort of stuff now why find it would you do that every night but anyway he said he did so it got um three years into his stay and his first sign of rescue came and his first sign of rescue was uh, two galleons were at anchor. And he saw them that afternoon. And he saw the uh, the, the, the little uh, longboats coming up to the beach. And he went down to it. But he had to be careful because he knew Johnny well. The Spanish uh, used to go into that uh, cove as well. Now, this is the first time we've seen anything in three years. So, but he went down and he saw they were actually Spanish and they chased them up the beach. And he ran in under all his uh, trees and all that and they were chasing after him. And he said he climbed his tree and hid at the top of a tree. Which to me doesn't seem like a great idea, you know. But anyway, that's where he hid. And he said he was looking down and he was looking at them. And they are actually more bothered in uh, killing and skinning goats. For their own uh, group group steaks, because you know yourself at sea, long time, bit of fresh meat. So they headed off, 
and it was going to be another year and a half before he was actually rescued because he ended up four years and four months on the island and funny enough it was actually at the same time he was hiding from the Spanish to uh, another uh, captain of a ship which was getting uh, two ships together to go off and do a bit more privateering and this guy was his his name was Woods Rogers and he was getting his uh, two ships together are getting funding for getting his two ships together in uh, Bristol in England and really uh, this privateering and getting funding for ships and all that uh, re really was like uh, like uh, Bitcoin you know invest into this and we, we do a bit of privateering and we get a, a Spanish galleon or whatever we'll all share out the money and all that so I mean they were really doing this a long time ago weren't they so Rogers had two ships, the Duke and the Duchess, and they were sail sailing down to the Pacific, or was actually known at the time, or as well at the time, uh, the Spanish Lakes. So what he was looking for uh, was the Manila Galleons. Now the Manila Galleons were a very, very large uh, Spanish ship, and they were owned by the uh, Spanish Crown. Uh, and they would have been very, very heavily armed, uh, many cannons on them, and much bigger than any of the private cheering ships that went down chasing them. So that's why they'd usually do a pack. So it would be like a pack chasing these uh, galleons, which they very rarely got anyway. And they would be going around uh, from the Millers to the, the Philippines, Mexico, uh, trying to get... Um, uh, some gold and some silvers but they'd be looking for uh, spices and uh, materials and all probably would be in the bigger end of things because that was worth a fortune when it was brought home anyway so after sailing the trade winds for over a year in the first of february 1709 where does he end up after getting blown off course juan fernandez Help, I'm here, I'm here. Come and get me, come and get me. Well, basically, that's what happened anyway. So as the longboat went into the island, they saw uh, Daniel Defoe. And uh, they uh, they weren't sure if he was Spanish or whatever. So they, they were, they were uh, hedging their bets when they first saw him. And then they saw him with this big straw hat and straw everything on him. Uh, the guy couldn't uh, string sentence together because his... his uh, his speaking word turned into pidgin English after being four and a half years on his own. Uh, brought him back onto the boat. Uh, he was happy as Larry, right? Eventually getting off the boat, left all his uh, furry friends and ghosts behind him. And in, in, in later on, he, used, he, he missed the island because he wrote down that he missed the island later on in life. Uh, oh, not too much later in life that the, uh, you get used to your own company, I suppose. So, and this is where the story actually is bigger than life as well. Because the, the Woods Rogers was still heading off down to get his fortune, uh, looking for uh, the uh, the ships he wanted to plunder. And they um, eventually, uh, about, I think about six months later, uh, did get one of the galleons and a, a, and a couple of other little ships as well but they got the big galleon they were looking for which was sort of on presidents at the time as I say most of them never got them they worked their way back up to England and they were quite famous because this galleon came in and it was like it was huge it was huge you know uh, see can I find a photograph for you yeah and when they got there the um the bounty on it uh the money they uh were about to make on it uh turned out to be in our money uh 23 million right uh and daniel defoe's cut was written down uh at the day in the local newspaper in london uh, as 800 pounds sterling not dollars now sterling right and that would be the equivalent of a hundred to hundred and twenty thousand 
dollars today. Uh, so, and you must remember, like, uh, to buy a cup of tea then now would be quite cheap. So, your pound in those days would have gone a long way. I'd say you'd, you'd find it hard now to spend a tenner a day. <laughs> so, uh, the story got out about him uh, by one of the local uh, newspapers in London. And um, he got very famous. In London, he got famous. And what does old Danny Defoe do? Goes on the rip, the beer and everything, had the money, good clothes, had everything. And uh, got himself in trouble again. Started fighting again and all that. And so again, then he decided, uh, I'll go back to old Largo and see mom. So went back to Largo and got down to the little village and it happened to be on a Sunday. Now, it's all documented, not making this up. And he was looking for his mom and dad and they're all up at church. And he went up to church and uh, he was standing in the doorway of the church and everyone looked up. Hey, who's your man? Dressed in finery and all. I know the frills and all they had in those days. And his mum looked up and said, Oh my God, there's my son. Uh, at this stage, I think he would have been 35. In and around there, not 100%, but in and around 35 years of age. Uh, so his mum went up and gave him a hug and all that. And they all went down to the house. And he spent the next couple of months um not doing an awful lot, but he, a little beach down there he used to sit on and he used to look out and he used to think of his own island and his little animals and all that. His words now, I'm not just thinking this out, his words it was all written down. And um, <laughs> so he decided, he decided, oh, geez, I had enough. I think I'll, I think I'll uh, head off again. Right, head off again. So he headed back up to London and joined the Royal Navy. Now, just before going any further, the name of the book, Robson uh, Crusoe's book, was written by Daniel Defoe. It was actually called The Life and Surprising Adventures of Robson Crusoe. That was what it was called. But, but anyway... Woods Rogers also wrote a book and it was called The Cruising Voyages Around the World. And he actually, in his book, he did mention Rob's Daniel Defoe uh, as well. Uh, so that's why there's, so there is actually, for a book or a story what is, is over 400 years old, there's, there's actually a surprising amount of information on it. So when Daniel Defoe uh, published the book on Robson Crusoe, I think the date there would have been around 1719. Uh, uh, now, here's the other sad little bit now. Uh, as I said, he joined the Royal Navy and he headed back to sea again where he was happy. And there's no doubt about that. And the last entry in a journal about him was Daniel Defoe, Dies at sea, 1721. Now, it probably was some sort of tropical disease or something, and that's all it was. And there's our story for tonight. Uh, I hope somebody looked at the whole story.